God bless the Faith and Freedom Coalition. Let me say this is the first time in my life I have ever been asked to follow an angelic choir. <laughs> and you know, I got to say I'm going to take up an issue with Ralph. It is really tough to be asked to go right after nuns. <laughs> you know, for you guys, that's about as stark a contrast as you can imagine. You go from nuns to a lawyer and a politician. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, by, by the way, a, a, as a lawyer, it, it's, it's not widely known, but, but actually a number of laboratories across the country have begun using lawyers instead of rats in their experiments. <laughs> there, there are two reasons for this. Number one, the scientists were grow, growing too attached to the rats. And number two, there are some things even rats won't do. <laughs> what a blessing to be with you today. <laughs> what a blessing to welcome you to Washington, to thank you for your courageous stand, to thank you for standing for faith and freedom. What I want to talk to you about this morning is I want to reflect on some of the incredible victories we have had for faith, for family, for the values we share. And I want to focus and highlight seven victories in the last year and a half. Seven victories. Let's start with number one, judges. Principled constitutionalist judges defending our rights. We see those on the federal courts all across the country. We see it in Justice Neil Gorsuch. And let me be one to thank God for the victory we had this week in the Colorado Bakers case. As you know, there a Colorado Baker, a Christian, a man of faith, declined to participate in a same-sex marriage, declined to bake a wedding cake that would celebrate a same-sex marriage because he viewed it as contrary to his faith. Now, if we lived in the sort of society that those who call themselves liberals describe, a tolerant society, that would have been the end of the story. He would have lived according to his faith and we would have respected that faith and the diversity amongst us. But there are those with a legal agenda that wanted to drive that baker out of business, to punish him and any other person of faith for daring to live according to your faith. It was a case that went to the Supreme Court. Pause to think, who would have thought a wedding cake would go all the way to the United States Supreme Court? It was a case that I was proud to lead a coalition of senators in filing an amicus brief before the Supreme Court in support of religious liberty. And it was a case that this week we won by a vote of seven to two. Now, virtually every media reporter, virtually every Democrat although I repeat myself. <laughs> they all immediately, did you notice all the press coverage said what a narrow decision it was? The talking points went out. Every tweet, every headline, narrow, 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 very, very narrow. All right, I, I may not be great at math, but 7-2, is 7 more or less than half of nine. <laughs> Boy, the reporters were over time. It's so, so narrow. Yeah, you had a couple of Democratic appointments who said, and they say it's narrow because the decision was based on the facts. Well, I'll tell you, the facts of the case, the so-called Colorado Civil Rights Commission demonstrated an antipathy, an animosity to faith that was visceral. 
And by a 7-2 vote, the court said the government cannot treat people of faith as disfavored citizens. You cannot discriminate against religious faith. That is not narrow. That is a bedrock principle of our First Amendment and of our nation. A second victory concerns life. Men and women here, you have devoted your lives to defending human life, to defending innocent life, every life, as a precious gift from God that deserves to be protected from the moment of conception until the moment of natural death. Well, we have seen in the last year and a half significant victories preserving innocent life. The very beginning of the Trump administration, we saw a return to the Mexico City rules, which means that our foreign aid will no longer be used to fund abortions overseas. We saw the administration pull out of funding the UN Population Fund, which was complicit in China's horrific practices of forced sterilizations and forced abortions. And we saw HHS issue new rules, returning to the old rules, prohibit, prohibiting taxpayer funding from going to Planned Parenthood in clinics that provide abortions. And not only that, we saw the administration rescind the abhorrent so-called contraceptive mandate in Obamacare. A mandate that was interpreted by the Obama administration to force or to try to force believers to fund abortion-inducing abortion drugs. The consequences of that decision is that the litigation against the little sisters of the poor has been dismissed. As I've said many, many times, you know, the Obama administration was litigating against the little sisters of the poor, trying to force nuns to pay for abortion-inducing drugs. As I've said many, many times, here's a really good rule of thumb. If you're litigating against nuns, <laughs> you've probably done something wrong. It, it's just, it, it's a real... It's a wonderfully reliable checklist, litigating against nuns. Yes, no. Stay on the yes side, of the, or the no side of that ledger, rather. <laughs> but those are tremendous victories. They're victories for protecting innocent life. Third major victory. It's the incredible tax cut we saw in December. A tax cut, cutting taxes on small businesses, cutting taxes on farmers, cutting taxes on ranchers, cutting taxes on families, doubling the standard deduction. What does that mean? That for a couple, the standard deduction goes from 12000 to 24000 That means next year, 90% of Americans will be able to fill out your taxes on a postcard. Now, personally, I think it should be 100% and we ought to continue to a simple flat tax and we should abolish the IRS. But 90% is a good start. Not only that, we saw marginal tax rates reduced at every bracket. We saw over 4 million Americans get pay raises, get bonuses because of the tax cut, 500, 1,000, more than $1,000 
or as Nancy Pelosi calls it, crumbs. <laughs> Marie Antoinette would be proud. <laughs> well, I'll tell you those crumbs. I was flying a few months ago on Southwest Airlines. A flight attendant walked up to me, hugged me, said, thanks for the pay raise. I said, you're welcome. <laughs> but not only that, an integral part of the tax cut was doubling the child tax credit from $1,000 per child per year to $2,000 per child per year. That is real money in the pockets of hardworking families. That means a family with kids. That's the difference between having the money. If you've got three kids, that's an additional $3,000 in your pocket. That means that's the money for your daughter to get braces. That's the money for you to take your kids, maybe to the first family vacation you've been in several years, to go to Disneyland. Or to send your kids to a summer camp, or to invest in a college fund, or to help pay tuition, or help pay health care. That's real money for families who are struggling. This is a group that cares about families. Doubling the child tax credit makes a real difference. Fourth major victory, we repealed the Obamacare individual mandate. Now that's a big deal. That's something I led the fight to do in the Senate. And I'll tell you, back in October, there were maybe a half dozen senators supporting us. Most of the conference said, look, we made a run at Obamacare twice, we came up short, let's not muck up tax reform with Obamacare. And a handful of us began making the case, both, both publicly and privately, that this made sense, that it made sense for the six and a half million people. Here's how the Obamacare individual mandate works. Every year the IRS fines six and a half million Americans because they can't afford health insurance. Of those, roughly 80% earn $50,000 a year or less. Roughly 40% earn $25,000 a year or less. About a million are Texans. So I want you to imagine for a second, you're a single mom. You're working two jobs. You're struggling to make ends meet. You're trying to provide for your kids. You're not even making $25,000 a year doing that. And to add insult to injury, the IRS comes along and finds you because you're, you can't afford to pay the premiums that have skyrocketed under Obamacare. It's one of the things that led Bill Clinton to describe Obamacare as the craziest thing in the world. About the only time in my life I've agreed with Bill Clinton. By the way, his recent media tour is going well. You know, we might want to pay, actually, to send Hillary on tour. <laughs> if we could get Hillary to go to swing states between now and November, perhaps every day, that would be really, really good. Because <laughs> there might be some voters left she hasn't insulted yet. <laughs> but we made the case that repealing the individual mandate is immediate and real tax relief for the 6.5 million people getting fined by the IRS under Obamacare, but it also provided the savings that is what enabled us to fund doubling the child tax credit and lowering the marginal rates on families across the country. And we went from in October having a half dozen senators supporting it to in December all 52 Republicans standing together and voting and repealing the individual mandate. That was a big conservative victory that no one in Washington thought we could win. Now, look, Obamacare is clearly the biggest unfinished promise Republicans have. We need to finish the job. We need to keep rolling up our sleeves and finish the job and repeal every single word of Obamacare. But getting rid of the individual mandate was a big deal and an important first step. Victory number five, 
school choice, an amendment that I introduced on the tax bill, became the only amendment actually adopted on the Senate floor. It took college 529 savings plans, very, very popular tax advantage plans that you can save for your kids or grandkids to go to college. And it expanded them to cover K through 12 education, to cover public school, private school, religious school, parochial school, your choice up to $10,000 per child per year. Now there was some drama in this amendment. It came to a vote after midnight Friday night, early Saturday morning. It's clear it was going to be close. We had 52 Republicans in the Senate. Early on, two Republicans voted no. At that point, the Senate floor staff, they picked up the phone, they called the Vice President's office. Vice President wasn't in the Capitol at the time, he was at home. They said, Mr. Vice President, it looks like we may have a tie, we need you to come down to the Capitol. So the Vice President got in the motorcade and began heading down to the Capitol. I'm standing there trying to convince one of the Republicans who had voted no to switch her vote. While I'm doing that, Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia, walks behind me and votes yes. There's an audible gasp in the well of the Senate. <laughs> Senate floor staff picks up the phone. They call the vice president's office. They say, Mr. Vice President, turns out we don't need your vote. We just got mansion. You, you, we don't need you here. So the vice president turns the motorcade around, begins heading back home. Manchin returns to his desk and a sea of Democrats descend upon him. <laughs> they begin yelling at him. I think they actually pulled out a stick and began beating him with it. <laughs> and about five minutes later, Manchin sheepishly walks to the front of the Senate and switches his vote to a no. So the Senate floor staff <laughs> picks up the phone, calls the vice president's office. They said, Mr. Vice President, we need you after all. It's about 15 minutes from the Naval Observatory to the Capitol. Vice President turns around his motorcade a second time. And 15 minutes later, the Vice President walks onto the floor of the Senate. He says, the, the eyes being 50, the nays being 50, the Senate being equally divided, the presiding officer votes in the affirmative. The amendment is adopted. And with that, we saw the most far-reaching federal school choice legislation that has ever passed come into law providing potentially benefits to up to 50 million school kids across the country, enabling parents and grandparents to save for your kids, to save for your grandkids, and to choose the best educational options for them. The sixth major victory, just a few weeks ago, finally, 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 the United States opened our embassy in Jerusalem. I was incredibly privileged to be in Israel, to be in Jerusalem at that embassy opening, to stand there. It was the 70th anniversary of the creation of the modern state of Israel. Seventy years ago, when David Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel, 11 minutes later, Harry S. Truman recognized Israel. I'm kind of embarrassed it took us that long. <laughs> but, you know, presidents in both parties had promised to move our embassy to Jerusalem. Presidents in both parties had broken that promise. We had a year and a half battle in the Trump administration. I energetically argued for moving the embassy, and President Trump made the right decision, and now our embassy is in Jerusalem, the once and eternal capital of Israel. The same week that we opened our embassy, the president made the decision, the right decision, to withdraw from the disastrous Obama-Iran nuclear deal. <laughs> president Obama had sent tens of billions of dollars to the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, the Ayatollah Khamenei, who chants, 
death to America and death to Israel. When he says that, I believe him. That deal would have led inexorably to the Ayatollah having nuclear weapons. Once again, there was a battle in the Trump administration. Do we stay in the deal? Do we pull out? I energetically urge the president the right thing to do for the national security of this country is pull out of the deal and use every force we have, economic, diplomatic, and if need be, military, to ensure that the Ayatollah never, ever, ever gets nuclear weapons. Seven victories and more to come. I want to close on a lighthearted note with a prayer request. Some of y'all may, may have seen that a week from Saturday, I'm going to be playing Jimmy Kimmel one-on-one -on -one in basketball. This came out of the Houston Rockets when we tragically lost Game 7 of the Western Conference Finals. I am a diehard Rockets fan. You sound like my wife. And Kimmel went on air and began making fun of the Rockets, making fun of me and saying the reason the Rockets lost is because Cruz went to Game 7. So I decided to have some fun with it myself, and I went online and I challenged him. I said, all right, big guy, you talk a big game. Let's settle this man-to-man, -man, one -on one-on-one hoops. The loser gives $5,000 to the non-political charity of the winner's choice. But we had some back and forth. Jimmy wanted to wear short shorts and a crop top. I give you my earnest commitment under no circumstances will I be wearing short shorts and a crop top. <laughs> Nobody in America wants to see that. <laughs> but I will tell you candidly, my, my team is, is terrified that Jimmy Kimmel's going to dunk on me. Um, I give you my promise that ain't going to happen. If need be, I will pull his shorts to the ground, but he is not getting to the rim. <laughs> So I, I played high school ball, I was a mediocre high school player, I rode the bench a lot, and I remain about a mediocre high school player. So I ask for your prayers that I at least once hit the rim and ideally have the ball go in, and more importantly that at the end of the day, okay, in a perfect world I'd like to see Kimmel with Spalding imprinted on his forehead. But in a perfect world, I hope that Jimmy writes a $5,000 check and helps out kids in Texas. And so I ask for your prayers, and I thank you for your incredible support for our nation.